Okay, let's get started. Uh, we're already a little bit behind schedule, but that's, that's pretty usual at this point. Um, we're in Acts chapter 19. The last thing that we had heard about was that uh, all these people in Ephesus had uh, gotten rid of their sorcery scrolls. They had publicly burned them because they uh, repented and they, and they wanted to uh, express their faith and their repentance. And so, uh, despite the great worth of these things, they got rid of them and, and dedicated themselves to the faith. And now we're going to see a little bit uh, of what the aftermath of all this is. Uh, all this preaching that resulted in people who turned from their old ways to Christ... Uh, it's going to get the notice of some other people who weren't so interested in the preaching of Paul. So let's begin with prayer, and then we'll start reading at verse 23 in chapter 19. Well, let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask that you would bless this time that we have set aside this morning to study your word, that you would open our eyes and our ears to, to see and to listen, and our hearts to understand uh, all that you teach us in your word, and that we may find opportunity to put those lessons into practice in this life, but most of all, to be strengthened in our trust in you as we look forward to our heavenly home. In your name we pray. Amen. So let's start reading Acts chapter 19, verse 23. About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together, along with the workmen in related trades, and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious, and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Men of Ephesus, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not to do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. <clears throat> if there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion, since there is no reason for it. After he said this, he dismissed the assembly. So another instance of a big crowd getting all riled up for, in large part, no reason. But let's take a look at some of the details here. First of all, uh, we're told as this event is unfolded uh, that there arose a great disturbance about the way. Uh, and we remember that at this time, the way is really what they were calling Christians, really what Christians were referring to themselves. Uh, Luke talks about it here, talks about it uh, much earlier back like around the time of the stoning of Stephen. Uh, 
uh, the way, right? Jesus called himself the way and the truth and the life, the way to salvation, the way to heaven. Uh, so we understand that name. And this great disturbance that arose is this matter of, of the silversmith Demetrius and his fellow tradesmen uh, being upset by uh, the disruption to their life and livelihood that was being caused by Paul's preaching. So uh, let's examine that. What were the two biggest concerns of Demetrius? What two concerns does he express? John? Yeah, so number one is money. And it should be noted that that's the first one that he talks about. And what's the other concern? Tom? That the, the goddess Artemis would be uh, diminished. Yeah, that there was going to be this, this disrespect about Artemis that was going to become, uh, become great and, and widespread and, and a problem. Uh, so, like I said, it shouldn't be overlooked that the first thing that he cares about is, is the profits, the, the money. Uh, it's pretty typical of human nature to point out that uh, what does he care about first? The thing that's going to affect him most. But I don't think we should overlook the fact that he does have some concern about their great temple of uh, Artemis. Which, again, because it is a, an idol, it is, is just a false god, uh, is going to be closely connected with a personal identity. Uh, and so we should know a little something about uh, Ephesus and, and, and Artemis and the worship of Artemis. So that's kind of a question too. What what sort of goddess was Ephesian Artemis? And I don't know if anyone here necessarily is, is a great scholar of Greek mythology, but a few details about the, the, the city. Um, from what what is observed through through history is that the uh, the temple to Artemis was of the sort uh, like the Parthenon in, in Athens, which still stands to this day. Uh, the temple to Artemis does not stand, but it was that same sort of thing, but actually even bigger and more grand. Um, so if you've ever been to that part of the world, or even if you've just seen pictures uh, of what the Parthenon looks like, it's a pretty impressive stru structure, it's big white columns and everything. Now, imagine that even bigger, that was the temple to Artemis in, in Ephesus. Um, I'll just pause for a second. Anyone else, any, anything that you know, or maybe you've got notes there with your Bible or previous notes about uh, Artemis? Yeah, Tom? Yeah, there's a note that's funny about it. She was a goddess of fertility. Yeah, and so being a goddess of fertility, uh, what sort of practices then were involved with worship of her? What would you assume? Didn't they have temple of prostitutes? Yeah, temple priestesses who were prostitutes. Uh, and, and very often in any kind of, uh, you might say, pagan, idolistic culture, there would be a goddess or god of, of fertility uh, having to do with both, you know, fertility for, for um, you know, women, uh, but also then for, for animals. And even sometimes in, in some of the older cultures, uh, tying in with the fact that fertility and the fruitfulness of the land and very often in those worship practices were um, sexual practices. Uh, and so you see what a, I guess you could say, what a great offense and great, great center of sin that it was. Not just the, the natural human uh, tendencies to sin and to act upon those sins, but now that humans had turned it into an idol and, and formed it into a sort of systematic worship, that their sinfulness was carried out in that way as well. Uh, so a lot of, I used to say, a lot of, a lot of bad things associated with, with Artemis in this great temple. And yet the great big shrine to all of that uh, part of the city's fame. Uh, let's see, question three. That's kind of a follow-up to this. What are some other examples of situations like this where the gospel causes people to feel like their identity is being threatened? And so we, we highlighted these two things, right? Demetrius, as the spokesman and then kind of the leader of this group of people, is feeling threatened because his very livelihood is threatened and his identity as an Ephesian, his pride, and, and maybe to what extent was, was a genuine worship of his goddess was all being threatened by the truth of the gospel. But what are some maybe slightly more contemporary, if not contemporary, examples can you think of of similar situations? Tom, get us started on the, the Jewish leadership. Sure, yeah, so, so one from that kind of that same time. 
uh, when I didn't say a little bit earlier, the Jewish uh, leadership there, their trust was in their religious ritual and their identity was in their leadership that they derived from that position. And there, it's not just the teaching about Jesus, but it's Jesus himself that they find threatening. Um, so that's a good example always because there you see it's not just the teaching, but it's actually the person that they reject. What about some other examples? That's a good one. Isaac? Yes, any, any area of life we identify with before our identity as God's children, right? It could be like nationalism or even within our families, stuff that might seem like good identity, but if we put it above God, then it's not good. Yeah, so that... Um, you know, idolatry in the broad sense, where anything that you, you fear, love, and trust above God that becomes an idol, um, then when we hear the true gospel, it can be, especially, to, well, to the sinful nature, right? It, it's threatening. It's, it's trying to take away that which we've created as a God for ourselves. So I think you listed a couple of good ones, right? Family. And so maybe even just the, the sense of duty to fulfill family roles then becomes elevated. And it's not my service to God, and it's not my loving my neighbor as God would have me do, but it's the thing that makes me who I am now. Uh, or nationalism, right? That not only do I just care about being a good citizen to my country because I recognize that the government's authority is from God and that by being a good citizen I am loving my neighbor because I serve my neighbor by being a good citizen, uh, but that my country is my heaven, and so I do everything I can to make my heaven better, and I do everything I can to uh, derive my happiness and my security and my peace from my country, and therefore I need to be very involved, and I need to shut down anything that threatens that. A uh, couple very good examples. Anyone else? Thoughts or examples? Tom? Well, anyone who looks to their own works to being racist is going to be threatened by the gospel. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, I mean, that's really the heart of what it comes down to, right? Is, is on one hand, in, in our sinfulness, we would like to be God. And the gospel tells us, well, that's your, <laughs> that is your sin, is that you, you've tried to set yourself up in the place of God and do it through these various ways. Um, circumcision? I'm sorry, what was that? In the time period, circumcision? Sure, yeah, that, that would be one, too. It kind of related to the, the Jewish leaders, but now... Um, kind of tailing off after that of, of those Jews who were still holding to uh, the ritual that God had prescribed to prepare them for Messiah as being the replacement for God. Uh, and, and there's another way that you can maybe simplify and summarize the, the whole heart of the matter is replacing the creation or taking the creation of God and using that as a replacement for the God who created them, which is seen in its most basic and elemental form in Created stone statue gods, um, you know the the Baals of the Old Testament, or the Asherah poles of the Old Testament, or the household gods that people brought around with them, which are these little things, which some of them, you know, archaeologists have found yet today, of little statues of um, you know man or woman look like looking things. Uh, one example that I, I thought of in relation to this as well is maybe a more specific one and slightly more contemporary is places in, well, say in the Americas where the native people uh, encountered Christianity and there was a hostility, or today, those who aren't even, you know, the third party who are offended on behalf of someone else uh, get involved and, and say that, that basically you kind of come in and try to eliminate and erase their culture and that your Christianity is an attack on their culture. Now, the sad thing is that, to a great degree, those early missionaries actually did do that, and they didn't exactly just preach a pure gospel, uh, which would have naturally turned those people away. Um, but a lot of those, those religions, any world that you'll find in the world, whether it be you know, in, in Asia or in Africa or, like I said, here in the United States with, with Native people, uh, where it is idolatry, even maybe without the, the physical idols, um, but so much of the, the, the religious practice in any religion that's not Christianity does then look just like these old idols of, of years ago, where it's, um, you know, immoral sexual practices or, um, you know, mutilating the body or, 
you know, trying to make the body more spiritual through use of drugs and things and, and that sort of thing, which are all, again, just different forms of the same kind of idolatry. Uh, but really not any different as you know, Isaac said in his answer from the, the other types of idolatry that we see. Uh, anyone else about that of examples or situations? I think we did a pretty good job of covering a lot of different examples on that. Uh, just for a, a little bit of further insight on gods made by human hands, idols, uh, let's look at Isaiah 44. Uh, verse 10 and following, just to see another place where God speaks about how he feels about idols that are made by human hands. Isaiah chapter 44, starting at verse 10. Who shapes a god and casts an idol which can profit him nothing? He and his kind will be put to shame. Craftsmen are nothing but men. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and infamy. The blacksmith takes a tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it out with chisels and marks it with compasses. He shapes it in the form of man, of man in all his glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It is man's fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and breaks bread, but he also fashions a god and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire, over it he prepares his meal, he roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, ah, I am warm, I see the fire. From the rest of it he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, save me, you are my god. They know nothing, they understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I used for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? So. You should have burned the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Should have burned the whole thing. Exactly. And, and I think you notice two things there, right? So one, the, the foolishness that something which would be so common and for all these other uses to serve yourself, then you would serve it. Uh, this thing which is, God's saying, it's, it's beneath you. It's for your benefit and yet you serve it. And then the other thing, uh, I think that stands out there, verse 13. He makes it in the form of a man, that it may dwell in a shrine, a man in all his glory. And so those idols, what are they really? They're really just a reflection of idolizing self. Um, again, that, that's really the heart of the issue. And Adam and Eve in their sin, that they were trying to be like God. Um, and so all these idols, whatever they may be, whatever form they may take, whether they are physical things or just, as we said, the things which we will value more than God, uh, they're a reflection of that selfishness, self-centeredness, uh, and the utter foolishness. And, and there are other places in the Old Testament, too. Uh, Jeremiah has it. I can't remember if, if Job has a section or not. Maybe this is the one I was thinking of. But Jeremiah does have a section that's pretty much like this, too, like talking about just the utter illogical foolishness of, of using something for one thing and then also worshiping it as a god. Uh, so God doesn't, doesn't pull any punches when he talks about idols. Uh, for good reason. Dangerous thing. Anyone else reactions about that before we get back to Acts? Tom. Huh. 
any of the words from the Ecclesiastes is, is it meaningless, it's vanity. They don't, they don't mean anything. They, 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 you have the form of a God, they have no substance. Yeah. Well, and you can think of uh, Ezekiel on the mountain with the prophets of Baal. Or, uh, yeah, not Ezekiel. Uh, Elijah. Elijah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Elijah there and the, the prophets of Baal. Um, and, you know, what does he cry out to? Maybe your God is sleeping. You, know? you need to wake him up. <laughs> Showing the, the powerlessness of idols compared to God. Fire takes that whole watered down altar and the offering and the altar uh, and all the water. Uh, let's see. Let's go back to Acts now, back to chapter 19. Uh, so we see the crowd, right? They shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. They're going to be, uh, they're offended, so they're going to defend their goddess. Uh, they all rush into the theater, and so think of those big. Amphitheater, natural outdoor amphitheaters that uh, those Grecian towns are famous for, and hillsides and the stones cut out of the side for seating, and, and the, how the uh, the sound naturally reverberates off of those uh, those hillsides like that. And now all these people in there, uh, hundreds, possibly a thousand or thousands of people, all shouting and riled up about this. Um, and Paul wants to go in there, because naturally Paul wants to deal with the situation, but he is discouraged by the disciples, and even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, discourage him from going into the theater. And so, trying to, to take a step out of the scene of chaos for a moment and just look at Paul, what does it tell us about Paul, that there were officials of the province who were friends of Paul? And maybe not even so much about Paul, but just about... Um, you know, this, this gospel work about the influence of the gospel. What stands out to you about the fact that there's these officials who are friends of Paul? Yeah, Terry? They were from and they were intended to be the deacons, so there's more connection between them and the lower class. Yeah. Uh, so again, that it's all for all people, uh, and that as we look through the book of Acts, we really do see people uh, from every walk of life coming into contact with the gospel and, and even being believers. And the fact that they were friends of Paul does not necessarily mean that they were believers, but that they were treating him favorably, had a real concern about him, and some indication that at least they were friendly toward the gospel and and. If they were friendly toward the gospel, then they probably were believers, or at least, you might say, good prospects. Uh, but yeah, the fact that, well, it's not just this religion for, for poverty or for outlaws who, who want to be outcasts. And it's not just for those who are high in society, but it, it's for all. Um, and so Paul, you know, there's multiple times where he'll stand before high officials and the gospel is there. And then there's times where he's out on the streets with the people. And the gospel is there. Uh, but yeah, something worth noting that officials from the province are, are friends of Paul, care about Paul. Uh, and in this situation, they keep him from getting into the middle of a difficult situation. Uh, back to the crowd. Why do they eventually settle down? How does this all come to a resolution? Most of them did not even know why they were there. But it eventually gets sorted out. Why? Krista? That was a rioting law? Yeah. More or less, they, they, uh, the city clerk, I think is how he's, he's called, uh, described, his title is described, quiets them down and basically says, uh, there are worse things that could happen, namely that we could get in trouble for this disturbance because there were rioting laws. Uh, and we've talked about it before, about how the Roman Empire operated uh, as an empire and how these particular cities would have certain degrees of autonomy. And Ephesus was a city that had a great deal of autonomy. And so it was the sort of thing where 
we don't want to get in trouble for having this riot because then we might lose some of the freedom that we have. Uh, and the city clerk points out the fact that really there hadn't been any crime. And if these guys wanted to press charges, then they had a system of, of law through which they could do that. Um, and so they eventually get quieted down um, because of an appeal to, you know, I'd say, an appeal to uh, a, a, a far worse thing happening to them. And I think, too, it, it gives us a nice insight into their society to say that, well, it certainly was a different time and a different place. There are a lot of things that are like our society, right? There, there are orders, there are laws, and, and there is order to be kept. And people do care about uh, how that law and order might benefit themselves. And yet you can see how easily a riot gets out of hand, and then you have to pick up the pieces afterward. And thankfully here, you have to imagine that the hand of the Lord was... Uh, at work as well, that they were eventually able to listen to someone who would appeal to them, and it didn't turn out worse for the Christians, and didn't turn out worse just in general. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, like you see, very often when crowds get together and get riled up, good things usually do not happen. Tom? I think it's uh, <laughs> somewhat remarkable that it says in verse 34, when they recognized he was a Jew for about two hours, and they all cried out in one voice. I mean, and, and when you bring that forward today, you see demonstrations sometimes, and it's part of it, part of their all the crowd is repeating the mantra over and over and over again. And the idea that the squeaky wheel is the one that gets the grease. Yep. Any, anything else from this account? in Ephesus before we leave Ephesus behind. All right, let's uh, move into chapter 20. We'll read verses 1 through 6. There won't be a whole lot to talk about here. This is just kind of telling us where Paul is traveling next. <clears throat> when the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece, where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So like I said, uh, don't have the map up today, but uh, Paul kind of going back to areas he had been on his second missionary journey. So Macedonia, uh, kind of that north of Greece, so you think of Greece and all those tiny islands down there by the, the sea, uh, and then north of that Macedonia, so if you can think a little bit of, of the map going up that top part and then coming down into Greece, and then he was going to go back to Syria, which as you recall is over there by Israel, but was not able to because there were some Jews who were plotting against him, and we had heard on Paul's second missionary journey in particular, I think it was Thessalonica was the, where they were most hostile, and they even followed him into the next town. Uh, and so it seems he ran into that sort of thing again in that region. Uh, and so goes back uh, by land to a different area uh, and gets at, uh, waits at Troas. Another detail to kind of pick up on here is once again we get uh, the we pronoun. And so Luke, the author, the human author of Acts, is once again there with Paul. And he talks about we because he was there as a companion and uh, associate of Paul, so writing from the first person, uh, plural there. Uh, and if there's one last thing maybe to add before we talk about the one question that's there, uh, we notice a, a list of men who were traveling along with Paul from these various towns along the way, um, and a number of reasons that they could be with him. One, you know, going along and, and doing mission work with him, but we have to remember as well they were gathering this collection that they were going to bring, bring back to Jerusalem for the Jews. 
Uh, and no doubt their traveling along had something to do with that, that they were, uh, you know, being caretakers of that, being, being witnesses, of course, that nothing would get mishandled, uh, and then to being an encouragement going along on the trip as, as representatives of these congregations. Uh, so the one question that I have here, and it's, it's both just thoughts from what you observe here and then a little bit of background as it relates to the epistles of Paul. What was Paul doing during this time as he traveled through Macedonia and Greece? So first of all, how would you summarize it? And then we'll add in some details about some of the things we know he was doing. Terry? Preaching the gospel. Yeah, it's preaching the gospel. And worth noting that these are places where he's already preached, right? So he's going back and, and strengthening, encouraging. Uh, just because they had it preached to them once didn't mean that they didn't need more of it. Uh, the other thing that we can say is he was uh, not just encouraging in the places where he was, but was writing letters. In particular, during this time, uh, sometime in there would have been when he wrote his letter to the Romans, um, most likely when he was in Corinth because of the way that he talks about it in, um, in the book of, of Romans. And so the Romans is one that he writes to them before he really gets out there. Uh, to see them. He hasn't been to Rome yet, and yet that encouragement there to those people uh, during this time. And so we've kind of noted that a little bit along the way, uh, some of these instances where he, where did Paul write these letters? Probably more useful to us when we're studying those books and those letters, and then to look back at Acts and see where was it that Paul was at at this time, uh, and kind of relate it to, well, when was he there in that place that he's writing to these people? Um, in this case, Romans, he hasn't been there, but he's writing to encourage them. Uh, let's keep moving. Uh, next story as we close our, our time here. Verses 7 through 12. So Paul is in Troas, and in verse 7 we hear, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. <clears throat> After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So here again, a quite remarkable story about the, the power of God being demonstrated through Paul. Let's take a look at, at a few of the details. So Paul is in Troas. He's really stopping there only because he, he couldn't follow his initial plan to go uh, directly to Syria to sail back there. Uh, and so his time is short. He's, he's in the midst of travels. And he's going to make the most of the time, talking for a long time. Uh, we're told that on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. What exactly does it mean that the believers came together to break bread? Eat together. Eat together. Yeah, so they, they ate together. And they're also... Tom? Well, it says it was the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, the day of worship, so... Yeah, so it's not necessary to say with absolute certainty that every time breaking bread is mentioned, it's reference to the Lord's Supper. Um, because there's, there's definitely times where breaking bread does not refer specifically to the Lord's Supper. Um, but it would seem that in general the practice, as you see it throughout Acts, is that when the believers are together to break bread, there's usually worship associated with it. You know, worship as we think, right? That they, they would read from scriptures, encourage one another with the words of Christ, sing songs, all the things that are worship. Uh, and so the, the Lord's Supper would naturally be a part of that. But we learn from the book of Corinthians uh, that the Lord's Supper was generally celebrated in association with what was called the agape meal, love uh, meal, that was more or less just a 
typical meal, and then when they were done with that, they would have the Lord's Supper with it, which, uh, understandably, does follow that, that pattern of, of when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. What was he doing? He was eating the Passover meal with his disciples, which was a real meal, um, despite its, its particular significance, God commanded significance, and then at the end of it, the Lord uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. And so their, their practice seemed to be very often that uh, they would gather together, they would have this meal, and then they would have the Lord's Supper as, as a part of it toward the end. Uh, of course, it comes up in Corinthians because they were abusing it and, and misusing it. Um, people were getting together and those who had more means were, were kind of eating a lot and, and gorging themselves and having a good time and not taking care of those who didn't and they were doing it at different times and then they would kind of have the Lord's Supper thrown in there and Paul says what you have is not the sacrament at all because you're not you're not actually gathering as a, a church together in, in unity and you're using this really just for your own benefit and then you just happen to have the Lord's Supper in there as well because it's something that you think you should do and so it kind of corrects their practice. Coming back to this, though, we would say, first of all, it would just seem to be eating together. That definitely happens. Uh, but because of the worship aspect of it, it would seem likely that Lord's Supper is included. But then you hear Paul goes back up again and breaks bread, and there really wouldn't seem to be any reason, any indication that that means, well, they had the Lord's Supper, generally speaking, and then Paul went and then they specifically did it at this late time. Uh, because in addition to that, the way that uh, it's described that Paul goes up again and talks, is that he doesn't go back up and start teaching again, but his talking was more of the conversational type at that point. Uh, so, breaking bread, don't push it, but understand that very often when it's related to a worshipful gathering, that that would seem to indicate the Lord's Supper. Um, as, as would be good practice that they would follow, right? Uh, you hear it right away, the uh, the believers in Jerusalem come together to, to pray and uh, breaking bread, worship, fellowship, in the in true sense. Uh, Tom? Yeah. Well, wouldn't this be a case where, if you, you want to make a firm statement that the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper frequently, you wouldn't come to this passage because it's a little unclear if you go, if you go somewhere else, find another passage that talks about how, how frequently Right. And similarly, you, you, you pointed out accurately, first day of the week would have meant this was a Sunday. We wouldn't go to this passage to say that, well, that's why we need to worship on Sunday. Because if we remember the setting, Paul just happens to be there because that's how his travels are working out. And if he had showed up on Monday, they probably would have done the same thing because that's the only day he was there. Now, is it very likely that Sunday was their typical get day to gather? Well, yeah, it was, was kind of the practice pretty shortly afterward because it was a Sunday when the Lord rose um, and so that was kind of the pattern for for worship and then that too it was separate from the Jews who were maintaining the Sabbath and the old practice of things. Tom? Was it, is it true that the early church they never had a worship service without the Lord's Supper being part of it? That every time they got together they celebrated the Lord's Supper? Um, I, I can't say with certainty one way or the other, and I don't know. I mean, it, it, you look at Acts, you read the epistles, and there's not really anything that's said definitively about that. And as far as church history goes and records of early church that maybe is a little bit later than New Testament times, I simply don't know. Um, I don't know where, where the... Uh, where the frequency or infrequency kind of came into the picture. I just seem to remember reading that in the commentary once that, that that was just part of the common practice that they always included the uh, Lord's Supper when they, when they met for worship. Yeah, and I, I think, I, I would think that'd be accurate because in general, when you think about it falling out of practice of being a regular thing, it, it is usually quite a bit later. Um, you know, like getting closer to the time of the Reformation where that sort of becomes the sort of thing that, that is done. And, and for two reasons. Uh, one, because as you get to that time of Luther and the Reformation, you get a lot more of uh, 
lot more of looking at the Lord's Supper as just being a symbol, right? And, and so as the sacrament is diminished, so too is then the need to practice it. And then you get on a little bit later, um, a couple of, you might say a couple generations after Luther, so 200, 500 years maybe even, then you get into the age of pietism, and there, there was uh, the strong sentiment against um, against things which were symbol or and really trying to be really bare bones on stuff. And so that was kind of the era where communion was done once a year. Uh, and that's even why as far as American Lutheranism in particular, uh, when it came over here into the United States that Lord's Supper was once a year twice a year, quarter, something like that, very infrequent uh, in certain church bodies early on is because of those pietistic roots from back in Germany, uh, back in Europe, uh, which was not a good thing. But that's kind of more recent church history. So I can't, like I said, I can't say with certainty because I don't remember, I don't know, but it would seem to be fairly, very much the case. Well, you, even if they did celebrate it, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. He talked about doing it as often as often as you do it in the of the day, but he didn't prescribe the schedule. Right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the fact that he celebrated twice a month. Right. You know, once a year, that maybe, you know, like you're, like you're saying, that's a bit much. Uh, you know, just exercising your freedom. But we, we, we do that frequently because he didn't say you had to do it every Sunday for your worship service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I, I, I would suppose, in general, how do we approach it as putting it into practice is to do it as often as it remains that we're making it use, you know, making use of it, we're honoring it, we, we see the value in it, but not so that it just becomes routine and something that we don't think about, which can happen if it's just something that you do every Sunday. You know, well, we just do it because we're doing it again. Um, a balance between that. And of course, the fact that we have sinful flesh plays into that too. You could misuse or abuse it whether you do one or the other. So the, the teaching is needed as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the remarkable thing that happens with this young man, Eutychus. Uh, so Paul was, was teaching, you might even go as far as say preaching to the people. Uh, and understandably, this young man starts falling asleep. It's late at night, they're going on and on. There's all these lamps in the room. It's kind of the, you know, the perfect time to fall asleep. And he, he happens to fall asleep and, and fall out the window. Uh, now, the first thing is, sometimes it's brought up, was does this mean that Paul wasn't a very exciting preacher? Uh, and then it, some, sometimes, I remember a professor that taught us the book of Acts at MLC said we have that hymn, right, Thanksgiving time, if you cannot preach like, or the mission, mission one, right? if you cannot preach like Paul, and yet here Paul preaches to the point where someone falls asleep and falls out a window. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as saying that it, it meant that Paul was un, unimpressive as a speaker. Uh, in fact, I think it's 2 Corinthians, I didn't write the reference down, but it's 2 Corinthians where Paul is kind of addressing those who are accusing him of wrongdoing, and he says, people say about us that they are very fiery in their letters, but in person he is unimpressive. Uh, and, and his point there is, is kind of twofold. One, that what he says in person is no different than what he writes to them. And then two, that it really isn't about him. So if you're not impressed by him when he shows up, that you'd be expecting something great, what he's speaking is, is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so you, it's going to hold the same weight whether it's in his letters or in, in person because he's saying the same thing. And even if the man does not impress you, uh, that's not a reason to diminish him. And so you say there, there could be uh, a certain um, element to it that Paul was just another speaker. And while well, he certainly had gifts from God, and it doesn't mean that at a certain point he was not going to be susceptible to people zoning out on him. Uh, especially given difficult circumstances. Uh, so here again, not to emphasize too much Paul the person, but just look at what happened. Understandable, humans in their weakness 
What's the situation? This man late at night falls asleep. He happens to be sitting in the window on, on the edge of this building and he falls out and he dies. And, and it's very clear here, he, he's dead. It's not, he appeared to be dead and then Paul says, no, he's okay, he's, he's alive. He's dead. And Paul goes down and uh, one of the, you might say mirror images of this is when Jesus comes to the, the house of Jairus. And what does he tell the people? He says, she's just sleeping. Well, here Paul too comes and he, what does he do? He first he says, he, he calms the people down. Don't be alarmed. He's alive. And the, the man is raised from the dead. And uh, the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So they got to hear the teaching that Paul taught them and they got to see the works of God there in their presence as well. Um, and just a short story. What, what can we learn from just the short story? Karen? Well, fellowship is great. Eating together is great. Potlucks are good, but we shouldn't do it late at night. <laughs> <laughs> there might be something to that. <laughs> If anything, you could say, as we're humans dealing with one another, be aware of our human weaknesses. Right. Um, you know, if, if, if uh, the pastor demands on having catechism on Sunday after the kids have already sat through church and maybe Bible class or Sunday school, and then he's going to do catechism, it might not be the best idea. Right. Certainly a lesson there. What else? Tom? I think there are two lessons. Number one, falling asleep during the sermon is nothing <laughs> and secondly, it isn't just old guys that have that problem. <laughs> and maybe watch out because you know what happens when you fall asleep. You never know. You might fall over. And you'll, you'll bring us back to life. Right? <laughs> right. But yeah, I think that that's number one, obviously, right? Is, is here's, here's the preaching of God connected with the power of God shown in a visible way. Um, and again, just kind of, uh, Paul's been in these places before, but that doesn't mean that God's not going to once again kind of give, give uh, an extra assurance to these people. His mercy is great. Uh, and, I mean, look at them taking, taking advantage of all that time as well to, to be focused in on the Word. Uh, it's a unique opportunity. Paul is there to teach them. He's the one that brought them the Gospel, and now he's there uh, on this brief interlude of his journey. Uh, but certainly, yeah, it stands out, the power of God uh, in word and in deed. And we'll pause there, because the next section uh, requires, well, requires more time to, to really focus in on it. Paul is going to start his way back toward Jerusalem, that part of the world. Uh, but along the way, he stops and meets with the elders from Ephesus. He doesn't stop in Ephesus, but he meets with them. And when he meets with them, there's some pretty, uh, pretty important points of doctrine that are uh, taught in their discussion, uh, both about, uh, you might say, Jesus, which of course is important, but then too about the, the doctrine of ministry and how it's carried out in the name of Jesus. So like I said, a, a section that we definitely want to uh, give plenty of time and attention to on its own. So we'll stop there. Tom. Thank you, guys. Another interesting lesson we can hold for that is when you're listening to a sermon, don't sit in a window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so be thankful for our padded pews that we have. Let's see. Anything else before we end? We're getting fairly close to the end of Acts. Paul's going to get back to Jerusalem and then Jerusalem uh, it's going to be all about kind of the, the trial and trials of Paul as he is arrested and then makes his way to Rome under arrest. Tom? Well when we started this lesson the first thing I thought of was how well this fit into the sermon about Jesus and the gospel causing division. You know, what, what happened with these things was the silver smith Yeah, the gospel, the confronts idolatry, the confronts the crucifixion, where the priest 
Yeah, and thanks for pointing that out because you see it, right? A bunch of people who were very involved with this superstition turn completely from it to the point where they burn these very valuable scrolls and yet there's these other guys who are very threatened by Paul and they go in the complete opposite direction and they want to keep their, their, uh, their money and they want to keep their religion and they don't want anything to do with this preaching of Paul. And there's the division, like you said. Uh, and how, how does it turn out? It turns out that they turn against some of those companions of Paul, the ones that they can find and that they can get. Uh, and no doubt it, it kind of stayed that same way. So, And Paul actually, uh, you know, even before that event, well, or maybe it's partly that and, and some other things, Paul talks about, I think it's in Corinthians, one of his letters, he talks about how how much hostility he faced in Ephesus, where he compares it to facing down wild beasts. Um, so, more so even than what gets recorded in Acts, it would seem, it was their opposition that even Paul himself faced. Tom, yeah? So I hit my gold star because it's obvious I've listened to your sermon. <laughs> yes, and you, you didn't fall asleep. You can have the gold star for the day. It's been a while since we've given out a gold star. <laughs> Nobody else probably knew they were even competing for it. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask that you would give us a strong faith that casts aside the, the cares and concerns of this world, the things that entice us uh, away from you, and that we would be like those in Ephesus who, who turned from their wicked ways completely, giving them up uh, in order to follow you. We ask that you would give, grant us that same spirit uh, that you would guard us and protect us from the evil which uh, would come against us as we know that uh, we will face opposition and that we ask that you most of all keep us strong in the face of it, that we uh, receive our eternal reward in your name. And in your name we pray. Amen.